All right. <clears throat> so we've looked at we've looked at all the gas laws. Um, and we finished with Dalton's law of partial pressures. So now we're going to uh, take a look at the uh, transformations that can occur. And these are all physical transformations. Changes of state. <clears throat> Any change of state is by definition a physical process. That is, the identity of the substance does not change during the process. Um, more often than not, the change is accomplished with heating or cooling, but uh, especially for transitions between gases and liquids, pressure becomes a factor. And we're going to introduce that topic in just a second. These are some of the common terms that are used to describe changes of state. Freezing, right? go from a liquid to a solid. And that's not just water. That's any liquid going to, to its solid form is freezing. So you can freeze lava into rock. Condensation is the uh, deposition. I shouldn't use that word because that's one of our choices. Uh, that's where the gaseous state becomes liquid. Deposition is where we go from straight from gas to solid. And I, I've got a, uh, and you can see in your slide set, um, there's a flow chart on the next slide that will draw these things together. Melting is take a solid, turn it into a liquid, like an ice cube set out on your tabletop or a stick of butter for that matter, if it's warm enough on that day. Or put it in a frying pan. Evaporation, where you go from a liquid to a gas. And sublimation, where you go directly from a solid to a gas. Think dry ice. Set out a piece of dry ice on, on a warm day. Actually, it doesn't have to be a warm day. And it'll, it'll go straight to uh, uh, gas from a solid. Now, you won't see the carbon dioxide as it comes out of the solid into the gaseous phase. But you will see condensation process as that cold gas condenses water vapor from the air. That's why you can see that cloud. That cloud is not, you know, it's a mixture of carbon dioxide and water vapor. Okay, so what does this look like? Um, I don't know, maybe I ought to, I ought to get this out of the way for one thing. Try that. There we go. So you'll notice we've got um, uh, gas at the top, liquid on the left-hand side, and the solid on the bottom. And the arrows show the direction of transformation. So if we're going from, if we go from the top to the bottom, gas to solid, there you see in that blue um, arrow, deposition. Now, the color coding has to do with the heat exchange. Which way is the heat going? Um, if we think of the, um, uh, of whatever gas it is, let's say, let's use something real like, like water vapor. This is our system. And uh, have I given you this talk before? System versus surroundings? Okay. I'll slow it down a little. <laughs> it's it's um, helpful to think of any type of process in chemistry or physics for that matter in terms of system and surroundings. And you define what the system is, whatever it takes to solve the problem. In this case, our system is water vapor. So this is our system. And everything else is surroundings. out to the whole universe if you want. Usually we, we confine the surroundings also. Um, 
just to make it more manageable. But everything that happens is in terms of the system. So if, if we add energy, and we use, uh, in this case, we're going to call it heat. If we use heat, we use a, a small q to denote, denote heat. Okay. So in terms of the system, what's happening? Well, it's gaining heat. So the process is uh, positive by sign, and it's also, uh, this is on a subsequent slide, is also endothermic. That is, endo meaning into, heat going into the system. Uh, oops, went the wrong direction. <laughs> Let's say, all right. Needs a different prefix, and it needs a different arrow. In this case, the gas, the gas is turning into a solid. I think I got my bearings now. Gas going to a solid has to lose energy to get there, right? Because gas is like the molecules are very far apart and they're just moving at breakneck speeds. And you got to slow them down so that any intermolecular attractions they may experience will hold them together. And that would make the solid. Okay, so think of maybe water's, yeah, water works, but carbon dioxide would probably be better. Anyway, as it goes from a gas to a solid, it has to lose heat, lose energy, right? So that makes it exothermic. Heat is leaving the system in order for that to happen. If you think of it in those terms, then the blue color says that the system is losing energy, exothermic. I think that's a bad choice. I would have gone the other way. I would have said red because... If heat's coming out of the, the gas to make it solid, you could feel the heat coming. You can measure the heat leaving the system. So I would have called that red, but I didn't make this slide. So with that caveat, all the blues are heat released or exothermic, and all the reds are endothermic. Heat has to go in. So think of it in those terms. Then if we look at going from a solid to a gas, the next one over, that's sublimation. We just finished with deposition. The next one's sublimation, where you go from solid to a gas, just like dry ice. And in order to do that, you have to add heat. You got to give those molecules more energy so they can go from the solid to the gas. <clears throat> then if we go from a gas to a liquid, that's condensation, heat is released. And go the other direction, <clears throat> evaporation, you have to add energy, so heat is absorbed. And then the last one, liquid and solid. If you melt the solid, then you're, you're, the system is absorbing heat. That's the, the red one. Right. Where's my pointer? Is. <laughs> this is being recorded. Let me see if I can do it this way. There it is. Right, so if, if you're uh, going from solid to liquid, you're melting. If you're going from liquid to solid, you're freezing. And the freezing is releasing energy. And yet, actually, you can measure that. <clears throat> as, you, um, as you freeze the liquid, you, you lower the temperature. Say, let's do it with water. Say the water is at 20 degrees centigrade or Celsius. And as you freeze it, you put it in a cold environment and you freeze it. That means energy is being released. And then right as it turns into solid, more energy is released than, um, than you would expect. And it actually turns to solid and heats up. That's called the latent heat of uh, fusion. Can be measured. I've seen it demonstrated. <clears throat> so, um, those are the six different processes that, that can occur that we're concerned with. 
phases gas liquid solid and the transformations that can occur and how the heat is distributed in the process. Now the next two slides are going to give you some definitions of uh, endothermic and exothermic and these are the processes that are responsible uh, that are responsive to those processes but it's all based upon the system what's happening to the system yeah come again that's all right you're not on camera <laughs> yeah one of each uh-huh All right, uh, and exothermic, freezing, condensation, deposition, those are all exothermic processes. So they're going from um, a more random situation to a more ordered situation, each one. Freezing would go from a liquid to a solid, condensation from a gas to a liquid, and deposition from a gas to a solid. And they're giving off energy in the process. Okay, difference between an endothermic and an exothermic change. Right, just endo, just look at the, the words. If you, especially in the sciences, if you, if you tear apart a word for each of the syllables, then very often it'll tell you what the word, what the, the thing means. Thermic is heat, endo is into. Right, that's pretty simple. That's a, that's a good example, actually. Some of them are more cryptic, but um, those are good examples of uh, etymology. What's the source of the, the word roots and the uh, prefixes and suffixes that go along with it? Okay. Um, so this just hammers that idea one more time. <laughs> Evaporation going from liquid to gas for a liquid to evaporate, its molecules have to gain kinetic energy. Right? And we talked about the um, kinetic molecular theory of gases, I think, didn't we, last time. <clears throat> and the, the, what it can explain about a process. So if these molecules have to gain, or atoms for that matter, have to gain uh, energy to evaporate, that translates into kinetic energy. Now, <clears throat> this evaporation is occurring all the time with a liquid. Sometimes it's, it's very, very low, very slow process, like mercury. Mercury is a liquid, it's a metal, and it evaporates very slowly. <clears throat> and that's one of the hazards of, of breaking a mercury thermometer and spilling it on the floor. That stuff flows into the cracks and it stays there. You can't get it out. So it slowly evaporates and fills the environment with mercury atoms. Over time, usually it, the concentration is not high enough to be hazardous, but um, it's better to get rid of it if you can safely. Then other liquids, like water, will evaporate much more quickly. All you have to do is just take a pan of water and sit it on the table and come back in a couple of weeks and most of it's gone. Uh, and other things evaporate a lot quicker, like a um, uh, uh, nail polish remover, uh, the kind that's pure acetone. Right? You can find it on the the pharmacist's shelf. You pour it into a beaker and set it out on the table and in a couple of hours it's all gone. So there's a difference in rate of evaporation. Now what are the factors that contribute to the rate of evaporation? Well one has to do with the vapor pressure. I mean uh, how much, uh, how ready are the molecules to leave the surface of the liquid. So if you have a liquid here, then you've got molecules here and here and here. And let's say for argument's sake, we, we seal it off. Right? 
So in the beginning, there are no molecules from this liquid in that space up there. So it's all one direction for a while. But you start getting some up here, and the process that's going on is both uh, evaporation and condensation at the same time. And you reach a point where the rate of return equals the rate of evaporation. And at that point, you have an equilibrium. <clears throat> and at a given temperature, you can measure the vapor pressure in here. And for that temperature, the vapor pressure will be a certain set value for the pure substance. And if you increase the temperature, you add in more energy to the liquid. Now these, the rate increases for evaporation until you get enough of them up here and the rate and it stabilizes at a higher pressure. So the vapor pressure is dependent upon temperature. Um, and that depends on what, what is it that is holding those molecules together in the liquid. Are the forces very strong in which the vapor pressure will be low at a given temperature? If the forces holding those molecules together are very weak, then you get a higher vapor pressure. Okay, it's much easier for them to gain enough energy to leave the surface. Um, and we'll probably, I'm probably stealing my own thunder. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. Um, but what affects the rate? Well, the temperature definitely affects the rate of evaporation. What also affects the rate of evaporation is surface area. Because at any given temperature, you have molecules here at the surface with sufficient energy, some of them, to leave the surface. If you expand the surface area, then more of them can leave the surface with the same energy. So you increase the rate of evaporation by increasing the surface area. But if the vessel is closed on top, you will not increase the vapor pressure. That's an intensive property. But the uh, rate of evaporation is an extensive property. In other words, it, de it depends on the area, right? an amount and an area. As you increase the area, you get more evaporation. But you don't get an increase in vapor pressure. That is solely dependent on the temperature. All right. So I can see your head's about ready to explode. I better move on. Okay, identify whether heat is absorbed or released during the evaporation of a liquid. Let's see. If the system is the liquid and it's evaporating, which way is the energy moving? Relative to the system, energy has to go in to give those molecules more kinetic energy so they can evaporate. So it's an endothermic process. Heat is absorbed. And that was the only answer. <laughs> okay. So here's the slide that I was, I was stealing my thunder from, where you have a liquid in a closed container. And you see in the beginning, you only have a few molecules coming from the liquid into that headspace up here. And then over time, you get more and more of them. And you reach a point where you have enough of them up there where the frequency of impact of the molecules from the gas on the surface allows them to re-enter the liquid phase uh, at the same rate as those in the liquid are leaving the surface. Now you have a state of physical equilibrium. Now that's in the, in contrast to chemical equilibrium. Those are, they're based upon the same concept, rates. Physical equilibrium is a rate of change, um, an exchange. One direction is the same rate as the other direction. That's a physical equilibrium as long as the identity of the substance isn't changed. But in a chemical equilibrium, um, where you have um, reactants yielding products, 
the equilibrium is established because this reaction can go both directions. I know when we when we learned the balance equation, right? We did do that. Didn't we? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you can actually get the reaction going both directions. And it depends on the reaction itself as to which one predominates, forward or reverse. But once these rates are balanced in both directions, then you have a chemical equilibrium. And what appears from the outside, the macroscopic um, evidence, is that there's nothing happening. And that's the same for both chemical and physical equilibrium. It looks like there's nothing happening from our perspective. In other words, you'll see that liquid in the, in the closed container, it will drop for a while and then it'll stop. It won't move anymore. Because now you're at equilibrium. Well, it looks like nothing's happening. But on the uh, microscopic level, the activity is furious. Molecules going one way and the other way at the same rate. Okay, um, there's another word that we use for that. It's called dynamic. A dynamic equilibrium is evidenced in uh, phase changes and chemical reactions, as opposed to a static equilibrium. Has anybody had physics in here? No, not even physical mm -hmm. science. Think of equilibrium, a static equilibrium, as opposed to a dynamic. A static equilibrium in physics would be like a, like a seesaw right there. If the force on this side is equal to the force on that side and the lever arm is the same length, then that's a static equilibrium. It, in fact, nothing is happening on the microscopic or macroscopic level, okay? as opposed to a dynamic equilibrium where the rates are, of change are equal. Oops, there we go. So, uh, vapor pressure, that's what's been described and measured for these containers with a, a liquid inside that will evaporate. <clears throat> and it's simply the measure of the pressure inside that headspace. Once the liquid has reached equilibrium with the vapor. So I said the vapor pressure depends on temperature. Yes, for a given substance, the vapor pressure increases with temperature. But it also depends on the nature of the, the substance. I did mention that, but we're hammering that one again now. <clears throat> So it all has to do with what are the attractive forces among those molecules. Are they strong forces or are they weak forces? If they're strong forces, the vapor pressure is going to be low at any given temperature. Increase the temperature, the vapor pressure will go up. But if it's a different substance with different attractive forces, then the vapor pressure will be different at the same temperature based upon its nature. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, um, let's see. Okay, that's ether. Actually, uh, dimethyl ether. Anytime you have uh, oxygen in the middle, and something on either side, like a car carbon, whatever it happens to be, that's an ether. You can take that same formula and write that. That's ethanol, the drinking kind. Okay? Same formula, right? Two carbons, six hydrogens, five, six, one oxygen. But they're different molecules. This one has very low attraction among the molecules. So if you open a container of, of this stuff, 
probably in less than a minute, you'll smell it on the other side of the room. But if you open this one, you got to put your nose right in it, you know, probably while you're drinking it, to smell that one. So this one has a much stronger attractive force among the molecules than this one does. And the vapor pressure for this one at the same temperature will be much, much higher than it is for this one. That's just an example of difference in, in nature of the molecules that causes the attraction and changes their vapor pressure at any given temperature. Um, this is known as a, I didn't know that was coming, <laughs> but, then, but there it is right there. There's the dimethyl ether. This is known as a volatile substance. And if you're in the, in the, uh, in the business of uh, harassing businesses for their uh, uh, environmental pollution, then you measure things uh, from their facilities or from their products called volatile organic compounds. You'll see them they're listed like that, the OCs. You know, every environmental fanatic knows that abbreviation. Volatile organic compounds. This is one of them, but there are lots of others. <clears throat> and they have a relatively high vapor pressure at um, room temperature. Okay, a liquid in a closed container evaporates for a short time, then condenses as the number of vapor molecules increase. The process is known as physical equilibrium. How about boiling? We talked about evaporation, but if you increase the temperature far enough, then you actually form vapor in the body of the liquid. You've added enough energy so that the, the liquid will, all of the energy now that you put into the liquid is going into converting from liquid to gas. As opposed to before when you were just increasing the temperature where you're adding kinetic energy to the molecules and that helped them vaporize more efficiently at the surface. But at the boiling point, um, no matter how much energy you add to that liquid, how much heat you add to it, its temperature will not change. Right? You can raise its temperature up to the boiling point, but when it starts boiling, then the temperature will stabilize. Um, graphically speaking, it looks like this. If this is uh, temperature, and this is a uh, uh, process. It's just going there. So if we go like this, we can raise the temperature of our, actually, let's go solid first. Let's put it all together. So this is your solid that you're heating up. And then when it gets to the melting point, like ice in a glass, once it starts melting and producing water and ice together, the temperature stops. So now you've got the transition melting from solid to liquid. When all the solid is gone, then you can start heating the liquid and adding kinetic energy to the molecules of the liquid. So it can increase again, and when it gets to the point where it's boiling, the temperature increase stops again. So this is liquid only, and this is liquid to gas. And the temperature will sit there until all the liquid is gone. And then you can start heating the gas up. Um, so that's known as a phase change diagram. There, there are other forms that it can take, but that's one of them. <clears throat> so, when does boiling occur? It occurs when you finally reach the vapor pressure at the surface of your liquid equal to the atmospheric pressure bearing down on the liquid. When now you can exceed, actually you equal the pressure, uh, vapor pressure of your liquid is increased to the point where 
it is uh, matches the atmospheric pressure. Now the normal boiling point, I think that's on the next slide. Now this just shows an example of some blue liquid boiling. The normal boiling point, the key there is normal. Normal means at one atmosphere of pressure. So on an average day, you might say at, at the ocean, at the surface, at the sea level, um, that would be the boiling point of your liquid in that location. That's why when you uh, go higher in elevation, the atmospheric pressure goes down because there's not as much air above you. Right? We talked about that with uh, Torricelli's barometer, didn't we? Did we cover that? Okay. I need some feedback every now and then. <clears throat> um, when you go up a mountain, the pressure decreases. So you don't have to heat your liquid up as hot to make it boil. Right? Because the vapor pressure will uh, is lower at a lower temperature, but now you have less pressure on the surface that you have to overcome for the boiling process to begin. That's why um, if you live in uh, Denver, it takes you longer to boil a three-minute egg. It might take three, minute and, three minutes and 30 seconds or three minutes and 20 seconds because you can't get the water as hot because it starts boiling, and then that's where the temperature is, less than 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, maybe they sell pressure cookers up there a lot more than they do down here. Um, so, in, in fact, that's the principle behind the pressure cooker, right? You, you seal your stuff inside the pressure cooker, and then you have a weight sitting on the, the top, uh, depending on how much pressure you want to apply to the, the inside. I think it comes in, uh, you've got the, the single piece, and then you've got two weights that can fit on the top of it. So you can have one level that's like 5, 10, and 15 PSI in excess of atmospheric. Um, and if you put 15 on there and you, you heat it up, then in 20 minutes you can sterilize anything. I think that's the, that's the trick. Uh, uh, yeah, I think 15 PSI for 20 minutes will sterilize. Uh, that's, at least that's what we used to do with our mic microbiological media. Okay, um, so the boiling point changes with elevation, I just said, because the atmospheric pressure on the surface of the liquid decreases with elevation. Now, if you go to uh, Mount Everest, then uh, your boiling point for your of water is 70 degrees Celsius instead of 100. <laughs> so you're, you're up pretty high. 29,028, I think it's changed for Mount Everest. I think it's, it's higher now. I know it's, it's getting higher, inching up there each year. The Himalayas are still building, as opposed to the Appalachian Mountains. They reached their height a long time ago, and now they're eroding. That's why when you go to the top of an Appalachian Mountain, you usually find vegetation. But if you go to the top of a mountain in the Rockies, um, you're liable to find rocks. <clears throat> There's no soil built up and the air is too thin. Okay. Um, so the boiling point uh, changes with elevation because of the difference in uh, atmospheric pressure. All right. There's the definition. I'm not going to belabor that point anymore. So, well, maybe I will for just a second. Concept check. What's the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees if it's boiling? It has to be one atmosphere. If you can reach 100 degrees before the water boils, or at the time the water boils, then you know the vapor pressure has to be one atmosphere. All right. That's not going to happen here.
because what were we 750 feet maybe above sea level at this point? In Beckley, I'm about 2,450 feet. So I should get better gas mileage coming down here than I do going back. If it wasn't for all the twists and turns, I guess. Intermolecular forces in liquids. That's what I was referencing before. The difference between these two molecules. Intermolecular forces. That is the forces that act to hold molecules together. As opposed to intramolecular forces. Those are the forces that bond the atoms together in the molecule. So you have to enunciate your words if you're talking to somebody and you're trying to explain the difference between intra and intermolecular forces. So intra means within and inter means between. So this intermolecular force is an attractive force that acts between molecules um, of the same substance or between molecules of different substances. That, that happens too. Um, by comparing, if you compare the force of individual uh, attraction between this molecule and that molecule versus the forces that hold their atoms together in the molecule, the difference in the strength of those forces is that the intermolecular forces are much, much weaker than the intramolecular forces. Right? The covalent bond is much stronger than the intermolecular forces. And that just makes sense. What would happen if it was the other way around? <laughs> the intermolecular forces would rip your molecules apart. Right? So the in intramolecular forces must be stronger. And for, for all intents and purposes here, we're talking about covalently bonded compounds like water, carbon dioxide, uh, booze, uh, as opposed to sodium chloride ionic compounds. Right? Those are forces that are holding the, the uh, anions and cations together. But um, you do get forces between those types of compounds and the covalent compounds when you try to form solutions, and that comes in the next chapter. So I'll not steal my thunder out of that one. We'll wait till chapter 8 to get that. <clears throat> okay, we can characterize the types of intermolecular forces based upon what two things are interacting. Okay. Um, yeah, I can erase those. I was checking to see if, if I needed those up there, and I think I don't. So do we, we talked about polarity in molecules. Okay, so if you have a polar molecule, that means it's slightly negative on one side and slightly positive on the other. And if you put polar molecules together, uh, if it's a pure substance, then, then the, the polar molecule here will orient itself toward another polar molecule. Best example of that is water. So water looks like this. Right? And this end is the positive end. And this end is the negative end. Okay? So if it's pure water, they will orient themselves to do this. Have the negative here against the positive. And you get that dipole-dipole interaction. So we say dipole because nobody's found a monopole yet. <laughs> right? If you got a positive, you always got a negative with it. Or if you got a north pole, you got a south pole on your magnet. There's no magnets that have north pole only. <coughs> In fact, if you take a bar magnet with a north and a south and cut it in half, now this end becomes north and south, and this end becomes south and north. It's strange if you try to think about it too long. But this is a dipole-dipole interaction. In fact, it's a special kind of dipole. This is called a hydrogen bond. Now, the dipoles have a certain strength, and there's, there's a narrow range of 
dipole-dipole interactions that we can identify. But this, this interaction, the hydrogen bond, is a dipole that is at the strong end of the dipole-dipole spectrum. And the reason it is, is because it has a very electronegative atom here. That is one that pulls on electrons really hard. And then it has a donor here, which is always hydrogen. It's got one electron. And most of the time the electron spins is over here. In fact, we draw an arrow like that with a positive tail on it. Like that. <clears throat> so in order to have a hydrogen bond, you need an electronegative atom here with hydrogen. <clears throat> and that can be, it's usually oxygen or fluorine or nitrogen, most often, uh, substituting for oxygen. And that covalent bond between the two produces a polar bond and gives you a slightly positive here. In fact, it's about the most positive you can get um, with hydrogen when you bond it with one of these three. I think there's some evidence that maybe sulfur fits in there occasionally, but uh, most authors will say just nitrogen, fluorine, and oxygen. And that's a strong dipole-dipole interaction. Now, what happens, what happens if you don't have the dipole available? All right. Suppose we have um, nitrogen, nitrogen gas, like that, All right? That's not polar, right? because you've got the same atom on either side, so they're pulling equally. That's a nonpolar molecule. But if we cool it down, if we go from gas and we cool it down, we can make a liquid out of it. All we have to do is, is get it down to minus 195 degrees C. And we can, we can make a liquid out of it. So what does that mean? If it's a liquid, there must be some attractive force holding those molecules together. That's the only way it could be a liquid. But notice we have to get it really cold to do that. Right? There's, if, if it's warmer than that, there's too much kinetic energy that overcomes the attractive force between molecules. Right? So what is it that's attracting these molecules together? And obviously it must be a very weak force, right? because we have to take a lot of energy out of it in order for those intermolecular forces to take over and form the liquid. Okay, so that's what we call London dispersion forces. Those are weaker than dipoles, and that's your evidence for it. Nonpolar molecules will condense into liquids, and some of them will even go, become solid. Um, and we can't explain it with dipole-dipole interactions because they don't have poles, so it has to be something else. And uh, I think it's lame, named after the scientist, London, calls it dispersion forces. So what do we mean by dispersion forces? Well, in any molecule, these forces are always there. They're very weak, and they occur. They're actually manifestations of electrostatic um, charge, but they happen instantaneously very quick. They come and they go just like, like a flash. <clears throat> and that's because the electrons are always right moving. So for an instant, this, this side may become negative and this side become positive. Just for a, a nanosecond is all it takes. And if this one is close to that one, then what does that negative do? Well, it repels electrons from here, and this one attracts electrons. Right? So if this one uh, attracts electrons, then they start to bunch on this side. And if it repels, they start to be deficient on that side. And for an instant, you get an attraction. That's the dispersion part. The electrons are dispersed unevenly 
in the, mo in the molecule. This happens in atoms too. For instance, uh, um, argon. Right? I can't remember the, the uh, uh, boiling point of argon, but it's pretty low. But that's just a single atom. And the electrons are dispersed unevenly around that atom too. So you can get you can turn argon from a gas into a liquid. It's known as a cryogenic gas. That is, if you don't keep cooling it, um, it will build up head pressure in your, your container until it explodes. So that's why containers of argon and nitrogen too have relief valves. Right, so if you let a tank of if you buy a tank of liquid nitrogen or uh, liquid argon, whatever purpose, and let it sit outside, eventually it'll all be gone, even if you don't use it. If you go by any hospital, right, usually around back, we got these big vertical tanks, right, uh, liquid oxygen in one of them. And sometimes they have liquid nitrogen too. If they're going to manufacture their own air, rather than purify air, they just say, all right, we'll just bleed nitrogen and oxygen together and make our own air. <clears throat> that way we know it's pure. <clears throat> but they're contained in the liquid state, right? Because it's, it takes up less room. And it's less hazardous than compressed gases. And you'll notice also that they have uh, mechanisms at the bottom with these things with fins on them, They're cooling fins. So they continuously cool. They have a, a a compressor going, and they cool the liquid to keep it from uh, gassing off. All of that is because of London dispersion forces. Those are the weakest forces, and they're always there, even in dipole uh, active molecules. The London dispersions are there, but the dipole forces are so much greater, you can ignore the London dispersion for a dipole molecule. They're just, they're just too weak. Okay. Um, there are other interactions that can occur. Right? I mentioned the ion-ion, so uh, sodium ion and chloride ion attract. That's pure electrostatics. But you can get ions attracted to dipoles also. Right? So you, you throw uh, uh, table salt into a beaker of water or a glass of water, and pretty soon it's all gone. It's in solution because the, the sodium and chloride ions are interacting with the water molecules. Right? So you have, a, you have a water molecule here, right? which side's negative? There. Positive. Positive. Well, if you've got a sodium, where is it going to attract? To that end. And if you've got a chlorine, it's going to attract to this one. And through a process called hydration, those water molecules attack the crystal of sodium chloride, and they just rip it apart. Okay, so those are the various types of intermolecular forces that are at play in, in any substances that we want to discuss. We've covered all the bases. Um, I've talked about dipole, dipole enough. I'll, I'll leave it there long enough to for the recording to pick it up. Uh, we don't need to talk about it anymore. Now well, there's a picture. This is a molecule between fluorine and chlorine. You didn't know that could happen to you. Two halogens. Yep. Fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine. So you see, what you see is the fluorines have the negative side and the chlorines have the positive side. And then they interact with one another in a dipole-dipole fashion. Hydrogen bonds, I mentioned those earlier. Fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen are typically what you see in a hydrogen bonding situation. Um, okay, let's see if I covered all my bases here. What accounts for the extra strength of a hydrogen bond? The highly electronegative element to which they're bonded, yep, that causes a shift of electron density away from the hydrogen, making it very positive. Not a complete ion, but very positive. 
and then the uh, uh, the electronegative element is more negative. Now, I showed you that in water here, but you can get hydrogen bonding in larger molecules. Uh, we started to build up with um, ethanol. So here you can have a hydrogen bond uh, possibility there. And that's why ethanol has a much lower vapor pressure than ether, because ether doesn't have the hydrogen bonding available. Uh, okay, so the electronegative element contributes the small size of the hydrogen nucleus allows other molecules to approach it very closely, right? So they can get in really close with any other slightly negative part of their molecule can get really close to the hydrogen and that forms a stronger bond, right? It's just like um, gravity, right? We feel gravity stronger here on the surface of the earth than we would at uh, uh, 100 miles up. Distance matters and that goes back to Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, okay, so those are two factors. Are there more? No, those are the two main factors. Hydrogen bonding in water, we talked about that. Yeah, well, I didn't mention that. Also, if you look at the electronic structure of this molecule, you got some lone pair electrons out here, which adds to the electric, uh, the negative side makes it more negative. Okay. Uh, the vapor pressures of liquids that have significant hydrogen bonding are much lower than those of similar liquids. And I showed you that example. Right? The difference between dimethyl ether and uh, ethanol. Same chemical formula, different structure, gives them different vapor pressures. So vapor pressure is that one property that goes down as the intermolecular forces go up because it's, it's stronger holding them in the liquid phase. Okay, um, the point of this uh, diagram, this uh, graph, is to uh, emphasize the, um, the difference between a what we call a homologous series, right? Two hydrogens with sulfur. These are all uh, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium are all in the same group, all in the same family, okay? And they can form dihydrogen compounds, each one. Well, we notice that as the, the, the boiling point increases as you go down from sulfur to selenium to tellurium. Those uh, atoms that substitute for oxygen in there are getting bigger. So, um, and they're not electronegative enough to give them hydrogen bonding. But they are getting bigger, which makes them, uh, size matters when you're talking about London dispersion forces. The bigger the atoms, the bigger the molecules, the more uh, probability there is to have an uneven distribution of electric charge around the molecule for an instant. So the bigger molecules will have higher London dispersion force, forces at work than the smaller ones. So that's what we're seeing here. As you go from sulfur to selenium to tellurium, the, the sulfur is smaller than the selenium, which is smaller than the tellurium, so the boiling point has to increase. You have to add more energy to, to boil the liquid. That's the point. Except when you get to water. The dotted line here is showing that water should, by extrapolation, be down here. But it's not. It's way up there. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees. It ought to be down around minus 80. Except it has hydrogen bonding and the others don't. Right? And that's fortunate. And it's a good thing for us. Right? There's so much water on the planet, 
uh, how would you like all the water on the planet to be a gas? We'd be in big trouble. Right? Humans are often described as big water bags. Right? We're, what, 70-something percent water? Liquid water. If all that vaporized like this, I mean, well, that'd be a bad day at Black Rock. <clears throat> okay, these London forces, and I've described them before, the point is that they're there for an instant and they're gone. But they're there long enough to produce the, the effect, the attractive force. They're just not very strong. Okay, and we can see, oh, here we go. See the, the series of noble gases from helium to neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Uh, as the mass goes up, the boiling point uh, goes up also. All right, so, oh, there's my argon. Boils it at minus 186 centigrade. Um, so as the, the atom gets bigger, the boiling point goes up because the electrons have more room to instantaneously go over here, over there, over here, to disperse. Uh, and you can see a similar effect with the halogens, with their diatomic molecules. Size matters for London dispersion forces. All right. And by the way, um, Everybody knows that sugar, table sugar, sucrose, will go into solution, in aqueous solution, just like that. And you can keep putting it in, keep putting it in, and it'll, pretty soon, you've got more sugar in there than you do water, but it's still going into solution. Why is that? It's all due to hydrogen bonding. If you look at the sucrose molecule, um, it's actually... Every place a line meets is a carbon atom. Right? We just don't drive the carbons in because they kind of get in the way. And then there's another carbon up here. Well, you've got, uh, actually we've got a bond here uh, to the, this is glucose and this is fructose. Let's see. I'm trying to think. There's an oxygen in here somewhere. I think it's there. Anyway, scattered around these guys are candidates for hydrogen bonding. And they're, they're all over the molecule. Right? So you get these interacting with water, and you've got some pretty strong forces holding them together. I know I make hummingbird feeder juice, right? Put a cup of water and a cup of sugar. It's easier and quicker if you heat the water up a little bit. But it'll go into solution, and then you stick it in your feeder. <clears throat> With no trouble at all, because of all those hydrogen bonding positions. All right. So let me, let me clear the slate. and hope that I'm still recording. It appears to be. I just hope my disk drives are big enough to hold the data. Because this program, it doesn't compress. <laughs> anyway, I better get moving. So, which are the stronger? The intramolecular forces are stronger. Right? They have to be. Right? I mean, aside from actually being able to measure the difference, um, the intramoleculars have to be stronger than the intermoleculars. Otherwise, our molecules won't hold together. They just rip them apart. Okay, which is stronger intermolecular forces? Inter, that is between molecules. Nitrogen or water? <coughs> you got to snap that one off just like that. Which one's got hydrogen bonding? Water. 
And nitrogen is a nonpolar molecule, right? It's got dispersion forces. So water has to be the strongest. And there's your explanation. We see that in the boiling point. The boiling point of nitrogen is minus 195 centigrade. Well, Celsius. I keep saying centigrade because that's why we learned it. <clears throat> and uh, water is 100 degrees, right? So there's 295 degrees difference in their boiling points. Okay? Uh, you ought to be able to get this one, too. Right? There's dimethyl ether versus ethanol. Have we, drawn, have we drawn Lewis structures? Yeah, we drew Lewis structures. Okay. So there's a Lewis structure for uh, ethanol and for dimethyl ether. Dimethyl ether is nonpolar. It has a lower boiling point. And ethanol has hydrogen bonding available, which makes it a higher boiling point. Which gas would have more, would behave more ideally at the same conditions of pressure and temperature? Okay. We haven't talked about ideal behavior, have we, in gases? Okay. I probably should have when we were talking about gas laws, but now I'll make up for lost time. Ideal behavior. When you think of ideal behavior, think of billiard balls. Gases are like billiard balls. They're bouncing around in this medium, and they're far apart, but occasionally they run into each other. And when they do, they just bounce off. They don't interact at all. Okay, that's an ideal gas. When does that occur? That occurs when there are no or very little potential for intermolecular interactions. No forces holding them together. Right? They just bang. That's it. Well, when does that happen? Well, it happens with nonpolar molecules. Right? So nitrogen would have less tendency toward intermolecular interactions than would carbon monoxide. Because carbon and oxygen ha are two different elements with different electronegativities. So oxygen would draw electrons more strongly than carbon, and you would have a slightly polar molecule. So the ideal conditions, um, they would behave more ideally at the same pressure and temperature. Uh, and so that would be nitrogen. Now, is there going to more to that slide? Yeah, why? And there you go. The difference is the forces that are at work between the two. Now, if you do have a gas that um, under these conditions is not behaving ideally, the way to introduce more ideal behavior is to do something to decrease those interactions. Right? So low pressure, just fewer molecules in there. Right? Low pressure and high temperature. High temperature means they're moving really fast, so they don't have much time to interact. Right? More kinetic energy. So high temperature. Low pressure, high temperature will simulate ideal gas behavior in a gas that's kind of stubborn. Oh, we're down to concept questions uh, at the end. Is this the last slide? Almost. Oh, we're doing good, too. Okay, so we can take time on it. See what we can learn from this. To hide some helium-filled balloons for a birthday party, you decide to place them in a chest freezer. Okay. Um, and when you retrieve them, you're disappointed to find the balloons are deflated. <laughs> so what's happened? In fact, whose law? Does this ring a bell? Temperature, volume. Remember that one? If you decrease the temperature, you have to decrease the volume so that it's still constant. Right? 
So when you cool the cool the balloons down, the temperature decreases, so the volume has to decrease. Right. Um, oh, and there was another question. Excuse me, I didn't go far enough. Um, as they warm up in room temperature, they return to their original size. What gas laws demonstrated? Okay, Charles' law. What happens to the kinetic energy of the helium during the warming process? Right, increases. Right, kinetic energy increases. And that, based upon the kinetic molecular theory of gases, is why they expand. They're exerting more pressure because there's more kinetic energy. And they're hitting the walls of the balloon and pushing it out against atmospheric pressure, I presume, plus a little elastic potential energy in the, in the latex. Assuming it's latex, I don't know. I'd be mylar for all I know. Actually, helium balloons are best with mylar. Any idea why? I'm sorry? <laughs> Um, you're half right. They don't let something out. Mylar balloons are less porous. Right? Um, rubber balloons, over time, will lose their helium. It'll just leak through the pores in the balloon, and they'll just deflate to nothing. But mylar is not as porous. So if you use mylar, fill them up, then they'll stay inflated for a long time. Plus, you can, you can print more stuff on them, <laughs> shiny stuff. In fact, um, every, um, what do they call them, uh, the firefighters that fight forest fires? I got a name for them, smoke jumpers. The smoke jumpers, they carry these uh, blankets with them that are mylar lined. All right, they're covered in mylar, reflective coating to... Uh, in case they get caught in a flash of blaze, then they, they pull that thing over them, and sometimes they make it through okay because it directs the heat away from them. Sometimes it doesn't work. Depends on the fire. Okay, how about concept question two? And by the way, if you want a whole lot more of these types of questions, they're right there in your review document. Plus, this time, um, I mentioned it uh, last week, and if you watched the video, you, you heard me talk about it. I've got the problems worked out in my handwriting, and I wrote really slow so it would be neat. But if you, if you work those problems and you get a wrong answer, then those are the ones you want to find out you know, why you got them wrong. If you can't figure it out yourself with your textbook and with um, advice from your neighbors, um, or you want to call me, then go to the, re the worked problems, and it'll show you how I work that problem. One way to work it. Very often, there, there are multiple ways to work a problem. What you want is the fastest way, right, <laughs> for exam-taking purposes. Okay, concept question two. A gas water displacement experiment is set up. A gas water displacement experiment. What do they mean by that? This is what I think is meant. You got a vat of water, and you have an inverted, um, let's say it's a graduated cylinder. So you fill the cylinder up with water, and you, you hold it on the open end, and you do like Torricelli did with his mercury. You just invert it and submerge it, and the water will stay in here. Right, so it's full of water. Well, a uh, water displacement experiment is you have something going on over here, and you deliver it in here. So it produces a gas, right, it goes there, and it starts to bubble, right, and it 
collects at the top. That way you can measure the volume. Okay, that's a water displacement experiment. It's determined that 0.812 grams of gas displaces 350 milliliters of water. So eventually you get down here to 350 milliliters, right from here to here. And the gas inside there, you, you can weigh it, right? the gas inside there is 0 0.812 grams. The atmospheric pressure is 750 millimeters of mercury. Why do we need to know that? Oh, well, let's see what else it tells us. The temperature of the water is 20 degrees. 20 degrees C. And the partial pressure of the water is 18 millimeters of mercury. All right, so the, the pressure of water at 20 degrees is 18 millimeters. Okay. So we know that if this were enclosed, well, actually up in here, you got a mixture, don't you? You got a mixture of the gas you produced plus water vapor, because as it bubbled through the water, it picked up water vapor and it equilibrated in those bubbles at that temperature to 18 millimeters of mercury pressure. So 18 millimeters mercury of pressure inside here is the water vapor. So what's the pressure of your gas? Well, you've got that much bearing down on it right here. Right? So if it's holding back that much pressure, then this is equal to the pressure of your gas plus the pressure of the water. Right? So if that's 18, then the pressure of the gas is 750 minus 18. Okay? So maybe we need to know that. Maybe we don't. Let's, let's do it. All right. Two, three, seven. Millimeters of mercury is the pressure of the gas. Okay, uh, what else are we told? Determine the molar mass of the gas using the ideal gas law. Okay. Work the problem. Work the question. What's the question? Molar mass. How do we calculate molar mass? It's the mass of a given number of moles, right? So, do we know either one? We know the mass right here, right? Got the mass. Now we need the moles, right? So it tells you to use the ideal gas equation, PB equals nRT. We need this one right here, so let's solve it for that one. All right, now, do we have all the information we need? Right. This R is in 0 0.082, I like 06. They said 21, that's okay. Um, liter atmospheres per mole K. Okay. So the temperature has to be in K. We know the temperature is what? 20 degrees. So what is it in K? No idea? Add 273. 20 plus 273. 293K. Okay. How about the pressure? Ah, the pressure of the gas. We don't want the total pressure, right? Because that's not the weight. That's not the weight of the gas plus water. That's the weight of the gas. So we need this pressure, 732 millimeters of mercury, but those are the wrong units, aren't they? We need it in atmospheres. So we need pressure in 730 divided by 760 atmospheres. Is that right? Well, it doesn't make sense. If this is one atmosphere, and it's 730 millimeters of mercury, Shouldn't it be in that arrangement? 
Right, 730 is less than one atmosphere. So this is the correct arrangement. You can do a dimensional analysis too. 730 millimeters of mercury. Right, get rid of millimeters of mercury on the denominator, atmospheres here. One atmosphere is 760. So that's 760 divided into 730, correct? Oh, two, 732. You were going to let me go away with that one, weren't you? <coughs> okay, so now we need volume. So what's the volume? It needs to be in liters. Right, so how many liters is 350 millimeters, milliliters? Three places, one, two, three, 0 0.350. Did I lose anybody on that one? Okay, you can do dimensional analysis on that one too and prove it to yourself. But if the unit of measure gets bigger, the number has to get smaller, right? So we went the right direction. And there are a thousand milliliters in a liter, so it's, that's three places. Okay, so now we can find out how many moles we got. All we have to do is that calculation. Let's take this one, 732 and divide 760 into it, okay, that's 0.9632, and then times 0.35, and then divide it by this one, and then also divide it by that one. Okay, I get the number of moles is 1.402 times 10 to the minus 2 moles. So, we can calculate the molecular weight because we know the mass, 812 grams, and then the number of moles that represents is 1.402 times 10 to the minus 2 moles. Right, so, 0.812 divided by the other number. And I get, let's see, how many significant figures? Three. 57.9 grams per mole. Okay, that's how you work that problem. Um, okay, they rounded it off to two. Oops. Huh. I just messed up my uh, animations. 58A is the answer. Oh, no, I didn't mess up. I actually did a slide where I worked it out. Okay, so this is given information. And we're using, we're using two different laws to find the answer. Actually, two different laws in one, met, in one calculation. That's not really a law. But partial pressure... Dalton's partial pressure, that's a law. That's how we got this. And then the ideal gas equation is a combination of all the other gas laws. All right. So then we do the calculation. There it is. For moles. And then there's the calculation for moles, uh, molecular weight. That's why I say MW, we used to call it molecular weight, but molar mass is, is, is a better term. It's just, I don't like writing MM, so I write MW. Okay, that's it.